call to this forum with another knowledge enriching vcm on taxation of digital assets so friends we live in a digital world today and that means digital assets are everywhere from something very common as the movies or the photos stored on the smartphones to the documents that we store on cloud and more most people are interacting with digital assets if not hundreds if not thousands but at least tens of uh, digital assets throughout a day why and what exactly is digital assets and more importantly why should you care we as star accountants are dealing with more lucrative and valuable digital assets more commonly most commonly known digital assets being cryptocurrencies or bitcoins uh i'll read you a little bit of this so satoshi nikamoto presumably a pseudonymous developer created world's first decentralized cryptocurrency bitcoin in 2009 since then cryptocurrencies have attracted investors irrespective of their demography the struggle which economies and central banks are having with cryptocurrencies is well known as far as india is concerned on 4th march 2020 the supreme court of india lifted the ban imposed by the rbi reserve bank of india on cryptocurrencies the judgment itself did not offer any guidance on regulation but simply in invalid- Created the RBI circular on the basis that it impugned the fundamental right of those engaged in virtual currency-related business without providing adequate rationale. Furthermore, in the budget speech for the year 22-23, the Honorable Finance Minister said there has been a phenomenal increase in transactions in virtual digital assets. The magnitude and frequency of these transactions have made it imperative to provide for a specific tax regime so friends to discuss the nitigrities of taxation of digital assets we at nagpur branch have organized this session i welcome to the forum our chairperson of nagpur branch ca jitendra saglani sir and request him to address the gathering so you're not audible yeah am i audible now yeah thank you so much ca swarupa regional council member ca abhijit kelkar in, in his absence here ca harish boneja sir the chief guest of today's session and who happens to be the past secretary of the nagpur branch uh, expert speaker of today's session ca siddharth banwat uh, who belongs to nagpur but now currently resides at mumbai colleagues in the managing committee uh, CA Sanjay M Agrawal vice chair but uh, vice chairperson CA Akshay Gulani secretary of Nagpur branch CA Dinesh Rati ji a treasurer of Nagpur branch uh, CA Deepak Jetwani who is a chairperson Vikasa other committee uh, members CA Ajay Vaswani CA Sanjay C Agrawal CA Tutti Bhattar and all my dear friends and colleagues uh, and seniors present in the meeting i welcome you all to this one more one more enriching session as rightly stated by ca swarupa digital asset taxation friends uh, we have with us our own siddharth banwat and uh, i guess uh, siddharth as he rightly st- uh, stated in the uh, first part that he had been addressing various gatherings week after week and he had been talking about va- various uh, aspects of uh, international taxation and this being something different uh, it's not just international but it's very close to whatever we are doing it will be impacting us in a, in a bigger way uh, in times to come so i think this is a apt topic uh, we at nagpur branch have been trying to have such topics which are of uh, different interest to each one of us and this being one such topic wherein we just want to understand what money is all about is it now the cryptos that will be replacing money is it the nfts which will be repla- replacing assets is it something else that will be coming up Uh, so siddharth i think uh, you'll be rightly covering all this in your deliberation because <laughs> i think the definition itself has been changing nowadays and i personally don't understand that without any government support without any government backing how uh, a crypto can be called a currency uh, and i think this question would be valid in most of the cases of people who are attending here uh, since government has not made it legal but they have definitely uh, say taxing all this 
So without making it legal, how they are taxing this uh, is something that also needs to be uh, stated and understood. But I think uh, there are a lot many queries amongst uh, people who are attending and uh, you'll be rightly covering all those. So uh, we'll be having a very enriching session today uh, with Siddharth. And thank you so much, Siddharth, once again, uh, for accepting our invite and being here. And thank you so much, Harish, sir, because on, on the last moment I connected you and you had responded positively to address the gathering. So thank you and thank you all for uh, doing uh, such a wonderful, actually, uh, say, having here and doing this wonderful session. Uh, I just wish to update you regarding the future session that we have. So tomorrow we'll be having a session which is called Life After Death. Life After Death sounds a li little different. Uh, spiritual session hai kya. But it is not a spiritual session. It is actually a session wherein we'll be having a discussion on succession and will, uh, and which will be addressed by C. Naresh Shakuriya ji. Uh, we are having a week-long celebration, uh, which is a CA week celebration starting from this Sunday, that is 26th of June. And we'll be having different programs in that. Uh, so I'm not, I need not wish to say, spell all those programs. But on the technical side, we are having one more session on 27th of June, uh, which is on the International MSME Day. And uh, we have a hybrid session here at the Nagpur branch, uh, wherein on this particular occasion of International MSME Day, we are having a seminar on opportunities in MSME and startup. Uh, after that, on 28th, we have one more pro Sorry, uh, sorry for the inconvenience. So on 28th, we are having another session, which is on proceedings that are happening under various laws. So how to face or handle those proceedings? Uh, it could be ED proceedings. It could be income tax proceedings. It could be uh, indirect taxes proceedings as well. So how to handle all those proceedings? Uh, this session would be happening on 28th of June uh, in the evening between 5 to 7. And we have CS Nehal Shah from Mumbai who will be addressing the audience. Uh, apart from that, on 2nd of July, we have another session in international taxation series, uh, which is basically on, uh, say, transfer pricing, that is international transfer pricing, uh, being hosted by Nagpur branch and speaker therein would be C. Harshal Bhuta. Uh, this is actually organized by the Committee of International Taxation. So with this, uh, with these updates, I wish to conclude here and thank you each one of you for joining here in the meeting. Thank you and thank you all. Thank you, Jitan, sir. Friends, we are fortunate enough to have Harish Boneja sir as the chief guest for the session. Uh, I now request CA Dinesh Rati sir, who is the treasurer of Nagpur Brand, to uh, introduce Harish sir officially to all of the, all of us. Thanks, Rupa. Audible. 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 Yes, sir. Thanks, Rupa. Good evening to one and all present here. We all are here for deliberation on digital asset taxation by Siddharth Banwar. And it's our pleasure that CA Harish Boneja sir has agreed to grace the occasion as his chief guest. And I am privileged to give his introduction. Harish sir is a commerce graduate of 1987. And after completing his CA course in 1992, he joined J.S. Obra as a partner. At present, he's a senior partner who is handling indirect and direct taxation as J.S. Obra. And he has been secretary of Nagpur branch of ICI also and president of Sales Tech Bar Association of here. Sir is also active in social service sector and he, will, he is founder member of Nagpur, uh, Rotary Club of Nagpur Ishanya. Sir, we once again welcome you on this VCM on digital assets, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh, sir. Uh, Harish, sir, may we have the privilege to hear uh, the words of wisdom and guidance from you. Thank you, Saruba, and thank you, Dinesh. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Chairman of the Nagpur branch, learned speaker of today's session, and my managing committee members. At the outset, I would like to thank the Nagpur branch for taking this initiative to organize such a seminar on a burning topic of taxation of virtual digital assets. Friends, as rightly came into discussion that there are various kinds of digital assets like digital currencies, digital tokens, and other digital assets with a speaker, Mr. Siddharth Banwar is going to explain us in detail in today's seminar. Friends, in today's uh, scenario for global turmoil, the war going on in Ukraine, the rising inflation and other 
economic factors the stock market and commodity markets are falling the value of cryptocurrencies have also fallen substantially we read daily in the newspaper regarding the bitcoin this from the high of 80000 per do dollar per bitcoin it has come down to 20000 dollars and i've read about a token which was named as luna which uh, was as high as 75 dollars in the month of may and within 3 days it became zero so the what is the value behind such kind of token i will love to listen it from mr banut so the big question right now is uh, how to tax the gain and losses and how it is to be treated so up to 31st march 2022 there was no clarification as to the taxation of the digital assets so the finance act 2022 has introduced section 115 bbh Uh, which came into application from 1st of april 2023 that is assessment year 2023-24 explains how the gains and losses are to be treated in income tax the definition of vda is also given section 247a the finance act has also introduced uh, the tds provision on the digital assets uh, even gift provisions are also applicable to vdas So there are, but however, there are many issues which still needs clarification uh, regarding the taxation of the VDS, which the learner speaker is going to speak to us. So the learner, without taking much of your time, you all must be eager to listen to him. I have declared this seminar is inaugurated and hand over the proceeding to the for further proceedings. Thank you, Arish sir. Harish sir has certainly ignited the uh, spark as to why one should attend this seminar, which equally goes, which equally falls in line with uh, our idea behind arranging this session. So, without taking much of your time, as Harish sir has rightly said, now may I request Chairperson Vikasa C A Deepak Jetwani to kindly introduce our speaker for the session, C A Siddharth Bandar. Thank you, Saroba. It's a pleasure to introduce to you all. our speaker of the session and my friend siddharth banwat siddharth is partner at tpu aswal and associates llp handling practices practice area of taxation including international taxation transfer pricing transfer transaction advisory and implementation and valuations he is commerce graduate with computer applications from university of nagpur a chartered accountant a company secretary and an advanced diploma in international taxation from chartered institute of taxation uk he is speaker of managing committee and uh, he is a member of managing committee and convener of Nas international tax committee of bombay chartered accountant society he is also member of managing committee of western region chapter and executive committee of the international fiscal association ifa india branch and is currently india representative of young ifa network he has been appointed as adit champion for india since 2021 he has been actively contributing articles on topics relating to international taxation transfer pricing exchange of information black money etc at professional forums like wic icai bcs and ifa so friends please welcome him with great round of applause welcome siddharth thank you thank you welcome siddharth thank you sir thank you sir i'm very sure we would not have had anybody more suitable for today's topic than siddharth with us so siddharth uh the forum is all yours over to you thank you swarupa good evening friends respected chairman nagpur branch chairman or uh, chief guest of the session c a harish puneja sir all my dear friends as part of uh, nagpur branch it's a pleasure always when i come to speak or share anything with the nagpur branch of icai because that has been the home ground where i have completed my chartered accountancy 
it's always a pleasure to interact with uh, our own people and share some thoughts on the topics which are of relevance in the current world as already explained and said about the topic virtual digital asset and its taxation though we are focusing more about the taxation as chartered accountants because that's bread and butter for us but i believe that the session would also focus on what this animal of virtual currency is what principally it is and why there is so much of fluctuation because once we understand the concept behind it or uh, the principles which are laid down behind this digital currency or this digital asset world then it would be much easier for us to understand the nuances of its taxation and that's where we will first understand the background basis which these cryptocurrencies or i would say so called cryptocurrencies and i'll explain why i am calling them so called currencies because first we need to understand that whether the nomenclature currency which has been ascribed to this particular asset or asset class does it really mean that it is a currency and what exactly are the features of this and friends in this technological era the point is that we have been looking at advancement of our lifestyle advancement of technology and we see that whatever we are facing or we are looking at today is technologically advanced but at some point in time we also may understand that some of these technologies which are brought to us and said that this is the revolution are nothing but repackaging of old concepts in the new form using digital technology yes there are certain open areas there are challenges there are some new developments around this which we need to be aware about but principally we need to also look at the fundamentals of these digital currencies which are being talked about and more so because they have got so much of attention from people for not for so much of right reasons because many people have invested without understanding it however as far as professionals are concerned i believe it is better for us to first understand the underlying concept behind the flow of session today would be principally to first understand how this concept of money or currency is been understood in the normal parlance how it correlates with the the concept of crypto crypto network what's the underlying technology which undermines this digital uh, currency or the cryptocurrency and what do we mean by tokenization what do we mean by these tokens how it is being treated globally from a regulatory perspective i heard uh, in the introduction that supreme court uh, decision uh, had laid it down that the currency or the cryptocurrency is legal however there is no regulation in place to regulate it and we'll understand why these challenges are being faced in india and it's not only about india there is a global scenario around it a uh, lot of these developments started uh, quite early in 2000s itself it has evolved over the period of time and it has got traction much more traction today and today when we look at uh, the virtual world there is a uh, the concept of metaverse there is concept of nfts which are there so we'll understand each of these over the uh, process and then we'll come to the Uh, the main aspect of its taxation direct and indirect taxation and then some aspects of regulatory framework which is there around it today from a foreign exchange management perspective so principally if you look at the concept of money itself what do we call a particular uh, uh, why do we link value to a concept of currency if we actually look at historical background we have always been taught that in the medieval ages or ancient indian uh, scenario there was barter system which prevailed so principally if we look at the historical framework a currency was not existing unless it was backed by underlying valuable asset and before those currencies came in foray 
people used to trade in commodities and these commodities were exchanged for each other and commodities derive value intrinsic value from its own usages so it's not only in india it was also globally that lot of these commodities were used to trade based on what country used to produce which particular commodity and in exchange they would buy other commodities which were required for their day to day consumption in fact lot of sailors at that point in time when they travel to unventured territories they came out with different types of uh, notes or they came out with different types of commonly used instruments which were exchanged as a value for transacting of trades or for conducting trades between two parties subsequently there were the first uh, way when the transfer of a particular currency took place was in early 80s or late 80s in usa when the western union concept was started and that was basically a transfer through the telephonic communication though currencies were not being transferred digitally or currencies were not being exchanged at two different locations but principally there was a exchange mechanism which was created through the communication which was done and it was being exchanged based on the message which was being delivered that's where the first fundamental virtualization of money began if you look at it from the western world perspective as far as india is concerned historically we have seen that there were multiple uh, uh, underlying gold coins which were there which had uh, the stamp of the kingdom which was uh, you know issuing those and that were being issued as commodity for trading lot of things now why do we need to understand the fundamental of currency or money because what we are debating here is are these virtual currencies really currencies do they have any intrinsic value in them or do they derive value from uh, uh, real currencies or can they be replacement to actual currencies which are there so principally if you look at the existing network or ex existing framework of uh, how the money or currency is being issued we need to first understand that what are the properties which a particular uh, item which is termed as currency or money which is used for transacting or a common common uh, uh, instrument which is used as currency should have principally the ideology behind that or the fundamentals of a money or a currency is that it should be scarce that it should not be abundantly available that anyone can print it it should be recognizable that means it should have a common recognition which can be accepted throughout by larger community it should be fungible enough that it can be exchanged for multiple transactions it should be divisible in such a manner that multiple amount of transactions could be undertaken by them it should be transferable because if they are not transferable they would not be valued at all and they should be durable now these are the properties which are laid down fundamentally with respect to a particular item being considered as currency and when we talk about the money basically this there is a system entire system of exchange or which has a unit of account or which can be stored for the purpose of making payment from one person to another that entire system is called a system of money and currency is basically the system of these different kinds of money which are in use in different nations that is basically termed as currency now why we are talking about these currencies in a different form because when we talk about barter system it would it was basically a commodity money there was underlying value to the commodity and when we talk about uh, fiat money it is based on the assurance which a sovereign government gives when the money is being issued now principally here what we understand is money or a currency issued by a particular government is recognizable only on the basis of the trust or faith one lays on that sovereign government we have been recently looking at lot of news around our neighboring country sri lanka where people are facing lot of shortages 
of uh, uh, important commodities. They don't, and every day government is coming out and saying that, okay, our economy has collapsed and the value of money, which is the local currency for Sri Lanka, <coughs> may not have substantial value when it is considered with other uh, uh, currencies. Now, what is that? When a government issues a particular currency, what is that underlying factor or an asset basis which a currency is issued? That is what we need to understand and that what makes it valuable. So a, a principal question which I would like to put across to audience, you know, uh, you can respond in uh, chat format is today when we use Indian rupee, does Indian rupee which is issued by government stand as asset or liability for the government of India? I'll wait for answer on the chat box so that you know, we can have an interactive session. And also to check that people have not left here uh, for me to speak alone. Since it's a virtual seminar, I can't identify if uh, someone is active enough. So looking forward for your response in the chat box. I don't know whether organizers can confirm if chat box is available to everyone. Yes, so it's available. So from an uh, Indian currency perspective, whether Indian currency stands as liability or an asset from government's point of view. I think, okay, so Stimbai says that it's a liability. Very well, yes. Principally, it stands as a liability because government is someone who assures that if that currency is being used for the purpose of payment, it will be paid or it will be honored. So from a government perspective, it is a liability that it owes because when we look at a currency note, it says that I owe you a particular sum which is denominated and which is which can be transacted with. Now, this stands as a liability, but on what basis this liability is taken by the government, there has to be a corresponding asset. And generally, in, in terms of the central bank or in the international parlance, these currencies are generally backed by assets, which could be in the form of gold or any other similar uh, asset, which could be commoditized. Gold has been one of the reliable uh, underlying assets basis which currencies have been issued. And some of the Western world countries or some of these countries where there is a lot of uh, value to their currency, you will be surprised to understand that they don't have an underlying asset backing that particular currency. And if I am, uh, 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 I, you would not be surprised to know that United States dollar is one of such currencies which does not have underlying backing. Similarly, when we look at this concept, from a broader perspective, what we need to understand is uh, the, the concept of money, which we understand is one, the cash we hold in the physical form and the deposits which we have in our bank or financial institutions, which remain as credited to the banking system. However, it may not be necessary that these balances may be uh, uh, you know, corresponding to the equivalent underlying value of the money which is lying. Because there is a liquid pool which is created, which keeps on translating while the transactions uh, are undertaken by uh, people of a particular system. And within that system, then the value uh, gets appreciated based on how much the economic value is created when these exchanges take place between multiple people. From an uh, Indian point of view, we have seen that digital push, which has been uh, the, the one of the primary factors of this government has increased more than 97% of a broader settlement happening in the digital form as far as India is concerned. Actually, if you look at the website, which is uh, UPI's website, government website, you will be surprised to know that how much big volume of transactions are being undertaken digitally using uh, UPI payment mechanism. This is uh, one of the mechanism for making payment. Now, why is this concept relevant when we come to the digital uh, part of it? 
because as we saw the fundamental properties of money all currencies principally rely on the scarcity value of it so if today dollar is traded at a x value to indian rupee it depends on the demand and supply or usability of that particular currency in the international parlance dollar or similar other currencies which are you know uh, which can be exchanged for other commodities that have real value in them and that is how one derives uh, the underlying value of the currency and if we look at some of these middle eastern worlds or some of these countries which have a lot of oil they may be smaller nations but their currency in terms of exchange value have higher value because they have good amount of foreign exchange reserve which they trade against their commodities which they produce or they supply to the world and from that perspective once we have understood the concept of money now let us understand this the the, the concept of virtual scarcity which is there where the currencies have come into picture or so called tokens have come into picture so principally if we look at the underlying technology which has been used uh, by these crypto tokens or cryptocurrencies is basically based on nonces and the hashes hashes are principally those digital uh, 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 codes which are used as a digital language for transacting or for codifying things now the novel approach which has been used is that these uses some of the decentralized ledger platforms and the the nonces or the hashes which are the digital terms are nothing but the checkpoints for transacting in these scarce uh, uh, scarce resources in through the use of technology such that the person who is enabling this transaction can also earn out of the transaction and it can be completed without having any intermediaries in between and principally if you look at the entire concept of hashes basically it is built on the blockchain technology whereby a transaction which has been initiated on a particular platform gets completed with the help of multiple players who are available open in that network zone which completes that transaction the best part which is there is the the scarcity which is created in this entire mechanism is artificial in nature and it is just that first mover advantage has been received by some of the currencies and predominantly if you see the bitcoin which is nothing but the first underlying technology which was used to transact or complete certain transaction backed by a distributed ledger technology which would avoid intermediaries in between and people who would be part of that network would contribute to that complete transaction trail and basis that they would derive value in the form of that underlying technological token itself we will understand further how these concepts have been correlated through the use of underlying blockchain technology and how they have been popularized subsequently but principally when we compare to the concept of money it's only that digitization the secured factor the signature factor which is there which is equivalent to a digital signature mechanism which we follow where a public and a private key is issued where a public key is available by uh, to the issuer and a private key which is the code which the digital signature user has when it validates the trans uh, when it validates the private key and public key match the transaction gets validated and a signature gets generated so similar way in in the virtual world when using an underlying technology if a unit of uh, a particular uh, value is transferred from one place to another using an underlying technology that's what is uh, used as digital uh, currency but what is of more relevance is that this entire concept of crypto network is predominantly based on uh underlying technology of blockchain and that is where we need to understand what this blockchain is what are the usages of that principally if you would ask me there are a lot of uh, uh misconceptions around this entire uh, uh concept the point is that one correlates 
crypto or bitcoin to blockchain and uses them interchangeably whereas the reality is that bitcoin or uh, any other form of virtual currency is nothing but a end usage of an underlying technology which relies on the blockchain and therefore we need to understand what this fundamental technology or a blockchain technology is and principally from an accountant perspective it is very easy for us to understand because it uses the term ledger in it and once we uh, understand from an accounting perspective it becomes easier for us to correlate with the real world but blockchain may not necessarily mean uh, necessarily mean that ledger has to have a double entry mechanism it it is just a record which is maintained in the form of ledger but there are multiple blocks which could be part of that entire chain and let us understand what this blockchain technology is principally the the basis of this blockchain technology is it is a subset or it, it is one of the types of a distributed ledger technology and there again i would like to clarify that we interchangeably use blockchain and dlt or distributed te uh, ledger technology interchangeably to each other but distributed ledger technology is a broader concept and blockchain is one of the subset or a type of that distributed ledger technology basis which transactions could be completed and the relevance of blockchain is more uh, uh, there when we look at the supply chain or different types of transaction trails which are created and not only from a currency perspective so this underlying technology distributed ledger technology is nothing but a sequence of transactions which are recorded in such a manner that the validation of this transaction is done on a open network by multiple people who may or may not know the underlying uh, uh, transaction or may who may or may not know the underlying person transacting that particular transaction on a chain however they using the algorithms or the codes which are necessary for completion of those uh, technological blocks will complete or will be participative in that entire process this entire uh, concept of creating or contributing to blocks to complete a chain of transaction by independent players openly in a market that is basically depending on a distributed ledger technology and that stores that data which is openly available to anyone who's part of that network and that is what it is uh, uh, makes it unique that principally when we look at this distributed ledger technology the data which is stored on the blockchain or this a uh, ledger is visible or available to uh, everyone who is available on the network there are different types permission ledger non permission ledger basis that the the experience may change but principally it is stored and completed and it is validated through such means that tempering of such transaction is very difficult and i'll explain you why that tempering is difficult second thing is that this entire mechanism relies principally on the mechanism of encryption that means the data which is transmitted in this entire chain of ledger is encrypted and that can only be converted or can be transmitted through mathematical algorithms therefore those people who enable these transaction in that entire chain are also called as miners or those are technocrats who are who understand the programming language and can enable that process to get completed through the digital means now when we look at the entire fundamentals of this network of blockchain what happens and how i will explain in a very layman terms principally let's assume that a transaction is to be undertaken for transfer of certain funds from one account to the other now principally today in the normal banking system the way we operate is we need to have the details banking details of the person who intends to transfer this fund from his own account so what is the basic requirement for the person who is a transferer that the person should have adequate balance for him to complete that process of transfer 
with a particular institution which may be a banking institution or maybe any other institution which may be permitted to store that value of currency or money now that account should have the details of the corresponding transferees account where those funds can or monies can be transferred and in such a way that they are received by them without any alteration in the amounts which have been stated to be transferred now for this purpose today we use banking channels we use private uh, payment transfer mechanism or we may use various payment systems which are available which are nothing but intermediaries who process the transaction and that is completed at times we have to pay certain charges for completion of these transaction which were uh, neft charges or rtgs charges uh, for the domestic purposes and when we do this international wire transfer there are corresponding transfer charges which are there and the first example is simply from transfer of funds from one account to the other in the same currency now let us put this in the blockchain mechanism same transaction the person who wants to conduct through a blockchain mechanism what how would the process work so the person that is the transferer who wants to initiate the transaction will broadcast to the open network that he intends to transfer a x value of amount to another person now there once that transaction gets reflected in the people who are participating in that open network so it is visible to everyone on a blockchain people participating in that network will be able to see that a transaction is available for validation now what is the requirement there those people who are participating in that network have to validate that transaction through the codes now what do we mean by validation so the the message for transfer of funds from one person to another will require certain codes to be generated to validate that it is originating from an account which has an adequate balance to transfer so the person who has to complete this transaction first will have to go and verify from the ledger that the originator of transaction has equivalent amount to be transferred once that person validates that particular part then it will initiate the corresponding mechanism to transact or to move from the transferer's account to the transferee's account transferee's account will have to be validated that it is what is being designated by the transferer for the purpose of transfer and in this process let's say when this 100 uh, uh, units are to be transferred it will ensure or the intermediate nodes or peers will validate that there is equivalent 101 uh, units which are available in that particular transferer's account and once they have validated it they would pick up and transfer that to the corresponding transferee's account through the algorithm now it appears very simple that it's just validating a transaction it could be uh, uh, the blockchain mechanism could be a uh, complex for other purposes as well but let us stick to this particular example that now a peers are validating the transaction now multiple people will validate different limbs of transaction and the person who completes this entire process which is a block will then put that block into that old chain that means the transferers account reflected 100 plus units in the bank balance or the balance which the person holds the person would then validate that transfer details have been uh, uh, completed or verified that the transferee's details are recognized and the person has a valid account then it would complete that transaction of processing that from one transferer's account to the transferee account by validating 101 units which are transacted such that 100 units get transferred to the transferee's account and one unit remains as a transaction fee which is earned by the person who has validated the block now when this validation process is technologically completed a particular block of that transaction which gets completed gets added to the ledger that this transaction trail of transferring from a transferer's account to the transferee account using the mechanism of validation through the uh, uh, the public and private key mechanism which is available on that underlying technology is completed that block of transaction will add 
get added to the overall transaction link. That means in this block of transactions, one would be able to see that the transferor account had a X value. Now it has X minus the transferred value. The transferee's account had a Y value. It has now the value of Y plus the amount which is transferred and in between whatever the transactional uh, 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 fees was levied, that is something which is earned by the person who has enabled the transaction. Now, when all this entire process gets completed, it will be updated again in the network that this transaction has been completed and the entire trail of transaction will be available. This is a very layman example using how the funds are getting transferred on a blockchain. But what is relevant here is that when we look at this entire blockchain mechanism, the technology which is used for transferring the message, that is what is encrypted in such a manner that the person who's processing the transaction doesn't know the credentials of the transferor, doesn't know the credentials of the transferee. All this is transacted all in the digital codes in such a manner that the transferor's accounts get validated, the transaction value unit gets validated, and transferee's details get validated through a code, and transaction gets completed without any of the participants knowing that who has transacted with whom. So this is the differentiating factor of blockchain mechanism, that though it is done in an open network mechanism, it is done through codes in such a manner that the person who is validating or completing the transaction doesn't understand or know about the underlying information which is there, what is being transmitted through those codes. Because everything is actually put in a cryptographic language that is principally based on the codes. And why they have been uh, considered as more uh, uh, non-vulnerable to leakages, we will see in subsequent slides when, when we understand. Now, Someone would say that in normal banking mechanism, also this entire process would be done in the same manner using technology, which could be some other technology. Like today, when we transfer payment from one bank to another, we use intermediary banks, we use swift messaging technology, which is used by the bankers for communicating with each other and basis that the transaction take place. The differentiating factor here is friends, that when a transaction goes through a banking channel, there are certain people who are sitting in the back end who may not be visible to us on the primary system actually validates that transaction and they know that okay mr x is transferring money to mr y and a simpler example would be that when you make a foreign remittance basically you get the swift code or a swift message which is generated in that the transferor details name address all those details are there amount to be transacted is there the channel through which it is to be transferred is written the bank details are written and the person who looks at or verifies that transaction knows the credentials of both the people and that's how that transaction is completed through the entry mechanism in this entire blockchain mechanism all these steps are done in such a manner that the data underlying it is encrypted in numbers so no one knows how much value is being transacted in that what they have to enable or the person who are working on the blockchain have to enable is only the instructions which are laid down that instruction is to transfer from the transferor's account to the transferee account and that is what they would validate and complete without knowing what is being transmitted and what is being transferred in that and once this entire chain is completed through the crypt cryptographic means this block gets added to an open ledger which will be visible to everyone. Now, this is the underlying technology of blockchain which could not only be used for completing the transaction, it is predominantly meant for also validating certain transaction in an entire supply chain. And that is where we need to first understand that this blockchain mechanism is not only meant for financial transaction, it is actually meant for non-financial transactions such as if a particular person is manufacturing goods in a particular jurisdiction and thereafter it is shipping to its uh, 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 warehouse in another jurisdiction through the entire transport mechanism and then it would be made available at that warehouse for the purpose of distribution and from that distributing warehouse it is being transferred to the end customer. There is an entire supply chain mechanism which is involved in that entire process. So first uh, after the uh, finished goods uh, is uh, produced at the factory, it would leave the factory, go to the relevant port or get dispatched from that factory. 
to the transporter from transporting mechanism it would go to the uh, port or an airport from there it would then get transmitted to the another jurisdiction through the common uh, uh, transportation channels from there it would can then uh, uh, be received at the other end in the other jurisdiction which would be cleared for custom processes and then it would again be received in the warehouse through the transportation mechanism this entire supply chain mechanism can be actually completed on a blockchain in such a manner that every participant of the blockchain is aware where that particular good is lying at this point in time and that is what is called tracking mechanism so there could be multiple forms of blockchain which may be there but broadly these blockchains are classified into two uh, categories one is a public blockchain and a private blockchain public blockchain means something which is openly available for anyone in the public domain or who's available in the network to come participate and transact in that in these public and private categories there are two sub categories which are there one is a permission blockchain and one is permissionless blockchain and i'll tell you what the difference between these two blockchain is as far as the public blockchain is concerned the only main thing is that it is available there is a consensus mechanism which is to be created and that mechanism is openly available to everyone and i'll tell you i'll explain in this entire process when we look at step 3 that is the nodes or validation process which is there there has to be a consensus that all the limbs that transferer details transferee details and the transacting unit details are to be validated once everyone in that block who's completing the different parts of verification generate a consensus that block will get validated in this entire process let's say if there is one block which doesn't verify let's say the transferee details doesn't get validated based on what the message has been the transaction will not get completed because it doesn't fulfill the entire transcription and therefore the consensus will not get developed and that block will not, never get completed so this consensus mechanism which is there which is basically multiple peers participating in a transaction trail is publicly open for everyone to participate that is the feature of a public permit, uh, blockchain now permissionless blockchain means everyone on that network can participate in that entire mechanism of initiating a transaction and also participate in the consensus mechanism that means anyone around the world who has internet connection can transact and can see the entire transaction log as to how it is completed examples of these public permissionless blockchains are bitcoins litecoin coins ethereum so these are all coins which derive value from their underlying technology of enabling a transaction second category is public permission blockchains and these are basically where everyone in the internet connection can see what transaction has been initiated on these blockchain however only restricted members have permission to give consensus or validate those transaction or the nodes which are participating can uh, participate in the consensus mechanism that is restricted and therefore though it is available to open public the permission blockchain means only few people have power to validate that and that is principally something which would be more restrictive in nature from a open blockchain that is what would be public permission blockchain now similar mechanism in private mechanism what is the difference private permission blockchain means it restricts both the ability to participate in a blockchain and ability to generate the consensus mechanism or participate in that consensus mechanism both is restricted by a particular player only for a limited set of people who are op operating in blockchain that is called private permission blockchain and where it is used principally these are used for organizations which are using it within their organization for completing a particular transaction trail those people will use private permission blockchains and what are private permissionless blockchain where the the mechanism that it is restricted for people who can transact but the consensus mechanism is open for public at large to validate and participate and get that transaction completed is available for public at large that is called private permissionless blockchain and in very layman terms in a real life scenario if you want to understand the difference between permission and permissionless the way simply i would want to put it across is that it is 
the concept if you have to relate yourself in this scenario and understand what is the difference between permission and permissionless so permissionless is that mechanism which you apply to your children that means your children never access or come for a permission to do anything from your perspective this is i am talking about the uh, the current age people who may correlate this that when whenever you say something to your children they may not listen to you they may not give a ear to it and when you want to correlate this with the permission blockchain mechanism the principle which you have to correlate in your real life scenario is when you look at your spouse wife so you you cannot complete any transaction without looking at your wife or taking a consensus from that particular person so in a real life scenario if you want to understand the difference between the permission and the permission less uh, uh, blockchain mechanism which is there this is what will give you a, a very real uh, understanding of this subject matter now principally why this blockchain has been so much into uh, uh, news and why it has been recognized so much the principal part which makes these blockchains more attractive is that first of all it works on a decentralized mechanism that means anyone open in the network can participate and complete the transaction so it doesn't the control doesn't vest in particular restricted areas the process is not centralized that means for today when we have to transact we have to either go to the bank and then bank would process those interbank transfer through rbi there is a centralized mechanism which is there in the decentralized mechanism one can transact with another without an intermediary so long as the transaction can be validated and those underlying presumptions don't undergo change and that is where the one of the important features of blockchain is that it is not using any centralized mechanism it's open for everyone however what is the challenge of this particular feature of decentralization it's very well accepted where the transaction flow is very less because the infrastructure underlying infrastructure to use or to store that data on a block for people to participate on that network it is very less and therefore for a smaller volume of transaction that is workable when you want to use this entire mechanism for a huge volume of transaction scalability is a question and its performance in that uh, scale is a question today though we may look at bitcoin as most valuable currency but in terms of number actually if you look at it there are a handful of those bitcoins which are there and that is where they have created their scarcity value since they are not easily accessible there is value for that underlying bitcoin which can be exchanged from one uh, mode to the another second feature of these uh, 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 this technology is tamper resistant and that tamper resistance means that when a transaction takes place you don't know whom you are uh, transacting with it's all transacted in digital codes and therefore it is very difficult for one person to alter a transaction trail now why is it difficult because if one has to change that entire block chain or entire blocks which are available as a part of that entire chain of transaction one has to start from first chain and validate or modify all the blocks which are there in that entire chain and then uh, modify the last block which is open yet not added as a block to the transaction tree and therefore all this process which is required to be done for modifying one particular block is required to complete that entire modification in the flow of the blocks which is not possible because it takes fraction of seconds or fraction of minutes for someone to complete a particular block however it may not be feasible for someone to uh, modify all the blocks which are available in the chain to uh, modify that transaction and therefore it is tamper resistant however it is not it does not mean that it cannot be changed at all it can be but it is algorithmically not possible in the normal parlance transparency principally this particular entire mechanism of blockchain technology is based on transparency that every participant knows what is being validated and anyone can validate that data which is available publicly now i'll give you this example of a blockchain use case when we look at a real life scenario 
let's say today when we have to validate a property transaction what we have to do we have to go for a title search document someone would go and validate it from the registrar's uh, document that a title owner is x person or not of a particular property now let's assume that if this entire mechanism is put on the blockchain the way it would function is it would be a public but it would be a permission blockchain that means the consensus mechanism that is the transfer mechanism would only be subjected to people who can validate that transaction which, which would be basically registrar of the property so registrar uh, 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 of uh, stamping authority that person or a sub registrar would be the person who would validate that transaction as far as the transfer document is concerned anyone who wants to transact so we'll validate the previous owner details create an agreement put the consideration uh, verification in place and that transaction could be completed on a blockchain now if this entire transaction trail is available on a blockchain what would happen is next when someone would want to transact that data of who's the owner of that particular property would be available openly and anyone can validate that so that's the difference and that's where initially when the blockchain mechanism was being talked about it was stated that central government may come out with a mechanism to digitize all the property trade uh, transaction trails now what it would mean that any transaction in respect of a property which is to be undertaken can only be validated through this chain and that means if any unsolicited transaction which happens which doesn't get into the record that will not get validated and one would be aware about it once it the person looks at the property detail on a blockchain so that's the advantage of having transparency in this entire open ledger technology now the uh, the point is that there could be various end uses where it may not be necessary for you to keep that data in open uh, or uh, transparent let's say in a private company mechanism one cannot uh, keep the supply chain open otherwise competitors would uh, look at it and take advantage of that so their private uh, permission uh, blockchain technology will be of use and last feature of this blockchain mechanism is security it because it's validated through a private and a public key mechanism it is actually has a lot of integrity to it it is validated through a third party mechanism and therefore has lot of acceptability but the challenge is the the temper resistance feature and the security feature doesn't mean that these crypto uh, assets or tokens which are or units which are held in a particular account cannot be stolen because the day i compromise on the uh, the underlying public or a private uh, or the private key mechanism i will be in a position to transfer that so i cannot temper the chain when the transaction is getting completed but that entire account can be transmitted and that's where when we had uh, read about lot of news that some of the blockchains were hacked and therefore all the account balances were transferred from that particular account now in this entire blockchain process one of the term which we, you will uh, get to hear again and again is mining now mining is principally the participant who is actually enabling that transaction and in that process who validates that entire consensus mechanism participates in that network transaction and earns uh, a, a transaction fee out of it in that underlying unit itself that entire process of validating a transaction by participating in the network is called mining and if you uh, will understand this there are many technocrats who have good internet access may have network abilities keep on uh, looking for such transactions and through codes they validate those transaction and earn a fee by completing that now the the technical nuance there is that these people are principally applying their engineering knowledge to complete a transaction trail and basis that they are earning in a unit which may not be equivalent to a currency so we'll look at it how does it affect them when it comes to the taxation aspect how the revenue is to be accounted for for them but the person who is doing it through the computational mechanism completion of the transaction or making available a, a storage facility all these people are participants to the network and they are rewarded in the form of same unit which are getting transacted now this is all about the blockchain mechanism but how does it create a value in terms of asset and when we look at different type of uh, uh, crypto tokens which are available in the market 
what is their value what is that significance of tokenization how these tokenized tokenized uh, uh, units have value or in them and what is their validity so principally if you look at the tokenization of uh, 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 this entire framework if there is real asset which is getting tokenized in a particular form through the use of cryptographic technology or through blockchain mechanism the value will be derived through an underlying asset now what it did i ex i explained you the case of property that say the property ownership today which is validated through a uh, uh the property sale deed or a uh, agreement for uh, uh, sale or agreement of purchase or a share certificate of a society which recognizes that the ownership of underlying share or a membership of a cooperative society that is what is an asset which is reflected in a script format another simplest example could be the dematerialized shares which are uh, uh, recognized in the form of certain units which are credited to the digital account and which recognize that it is a share which you hold in a particular company there is no paper trail which is there we have seen both kinds of era where physical shares were there they were converted to the digitalized form and the the physical asset ceased to exist but that uh dematerialized share derives value from the value of the company itself so there is a real asset which is there and in technical terms what these assets are called off chain assets that means a real asset which is represented through a token that would be called as a off chain asset and there are certain other uh, tokens which derive their value from no other asset underlying it but derives value intrinsically from the underlying transacting mechanism which is created on a blockchain that would basically mean a on chain token that means bitcoin is a coin which derives value from the underlying technology of transacting through a bitcoin blockchain and therefore it is a on chain uh, asset whereas if a particular bitcoin derives value from an underlying asset like a gold or a share class or a particular asset in the form of cars or stock that is basically a on chain and this only is a mechanism for transacting so blockchain is the underlying technology which is used to represent an asset in a particular form and this is what is the broader distinction which one need to understand one when one looks at an investment decision whether a person should buy a particular crypto uh, token or not so first thing is that from the white paper what you need to understand is what is the basis of this particular token is this token backed by an underlying asset and actually if you will look at the classification in such uh cases where a asset is backed by an underlying uh, or oh, sorry a token is backed by an underlying asset the fluctuation in the value would be primarily representative of the fluctuation in the underlying assets prices or the demand and supply factor to certain extent as far as only on chain asset tokens are concerned they are principally valued based on the scarcity which they have and second is the fungibility or the transaction requirements which it generates this is that the valuation is derived at so fundamentally if one would come to you and question that what kind of assets one should invest in so certainly the straight answer is that you look at those tokens which represents value of a real asset and whether that value of token and conversion mechanism is uh backed by a proper validating mechanism whether that asset will be assured so that insurance factor has to be there assurance factor has to be there and if that is comfortable for you then that asset class or that token could be bought as far as the other class is concerned it all depends on utility token they are not meant for investment they could be held as a utility which is like holding a, a unit for the purpose of transacting but one cannot consider that as a valuable asset unfortunately in this entire artificial world more value has been derived by these unreal assets which derive only value from the, the technology and lot of technologists have been arguing that it consists the value from the underlying technology which has its own value but i believe at you know 
it is only that early beginners will have that value later on it's not a rocket science all these blockchains are available in open domain one can create it's just about understanding that mechanism and putting it to uh, operating uh, uh, framework that is what makes difference that what value it should command principally once this entire dust will settle you will see only those utility tokens which will be valued will be those which provide real transfer trails and uh, those tokens only will be appreciated principally in a on chain world there is a issuer which is again a fictitious there is no underlying asset it issues a security by creating a value to it an investor invests in it and that's what it is uh, uh, reflected based on the underlying token this all theory is available on the white paper which is laid down on the concept paper which is laid down by these token entities which are issuing these tokens <laughs> so uh, i have already given these examples but principally what you can look at or you know in a normal form which you can understand is tokenized versus securitized is a concept which is on chain asset that it, it is just issuance of a uh, uh, or uh, giving a value to a particular category without recognizing it now what is the uh, uh, the regulatory framework around the world if we look at from a, uh, a global perspective lot of american uh, continent has validated or given a uh, regulatory framework for uh, validating these currencies or existence of these currencies uh, some of the countries have raised significant concerns like uh, uh, russia and uh, brazil has raised india is one of them who has raised concerns on these currencies because they want it to be regulated by a central body and countries like china and some of the uh, 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 uh the european countries or middle eastern countries have completely banned it or considered it to be illegal in nature now based on this underlying concept or understanding these tokens or uh, so called crypto currencies are classified into uh, three or four different baskets first is cryptocurrencies which basically derive value from their own underlying technology bitcoin ethereum being uh, one of the oldest example which have some value in that blockchain which enable other entities to transact and therefore they are still valued for the technology which they provide in this there are stable coins also like tether or usd that is usdt or usdc these are coins which are backed by underlying uh, uh, asset in the form of dollar reserves so what has these companies done they have uh, 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 bought bonds or uh, us dollar bonds with the us fed government that has been put as an underlying security and basis that they have created a liquidity pool to transact and therefore usdt and usdt are considered as stable coins these are not bit uh, crypto coins they are crypto coins but they are stable in nature their fluctuation will not be very high they will not fluctuate 1000 times or 10000 times as such bitcoin and ethereum can't uh, fluctuate so much based on their demand and supply mechanism which is there other category is utility token that is luna which was one mentioned in the opening remarks that this was one currency which actually went flat from 78 dollars to uh, 0.30 cents in a span of 4 days and then uh, this entire mechanism or blockchain failed completely avalanche or solana these principal blockchains were created as utility tokens for people to transact and make value out of the underlying transaction trail which is there it is basically that if you want to uh, have let's say e to re join and you want to put that anyone who want to put it in avalanche can make payment to me so it is about how many people are participating in that uh, uh, framework and that value can be transacted last i mean uh, it's basically a utility token is something which is just like a unit which is in replacement of a uh, value but uh, the way uh, these were marketed they unnecessarily created hype and valuation in themselves and then they collapsed so for one to look at utility token one has to look at the wide acceptability and the underlying robust technology which should uh, be there for enabling the transaction defi tokens basically are decentralized financing tokens again a type of utility token but meant for financing a particular transaction through the blockchain mechanism let's say 
uh, a trade of export is taking place between two people and if it is done through these one of the blockchains what would happen is someone who is validating that these transaction of export is taking place on the chain that means someone is validating the purchaser and seller and the underlying commodity which is being transacted through an open network one can put money and earn based on the money which is being uh, invested in that completion of transaction basically it's a trade finance token which is there one would put money and for that would earn interest kind of a remuneration for deploying that money now uh, from a, a real time chart some of the uh, currency is being valued uh, bitcoin being one of the top uh, on the charts some and actually friends there are more than 8000 crypto tokens which are listed internationally out of that less than 100 are actually transactable ones where people uh, uh, find value in them and actually if you look at the difference between the bitcoin and usdc coin which is there or usdt you see that their value is around one dollar itself because it's a demand supply game like a normal currency indian currency versus us dollar conversion since it is pegged to us dollar it would actually fluctuate only in and around us dollars value and it would not show a percent high percentage returns similarly defi tokens which are also in a normal range this is basically if you would want to correlate it with certain debt instruments which are listed uh, inter, uh, on uh, market where you will fund it for a particular period and based on the underlying risk factor of the transaction you would earn a reward or an interest on putting that money this kind of tokens are known as defi tokens which is basically decentralized mechanism of financing a transaction through the real money now because these are using blockchain one will have to convert from one form of currency to this and then transact it on this then the most artificial and the most fictitious form of uh, crypto tokens which are basically uh, traded on metaverse or uh, the artificial world which is so called is non fungible tokens basically it is nothing but, uh, but a artwork in the digitized form which has been valued and it is so irrational that there were some uh, nft tokens like these apes or monkeys which were put in the digital form and they were commanding value of 1 million for a unit so it is generally meant for a, a, a artificial a gaming world where people spend a lot of time uh, you know working on games and playing in the games and after completing certain stages they get certain value and these are now uh, you know uh, rewarded in the forms of tokens which are valued or which can be exchanged to each other so entire gaming mechanism is used basically to reward someone and therefore it has got a lot of traction and actually if you ask me uh, on very technical terms this is nothing but a time waste it's just a, a utility value which one may have of a particular game and basis that one may earn coins but it cannot be correlated with a real asset and therefore the 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 you know one can take risk only to a certain extent there could be real asset in form of nft also because nft also could be backed by a real asset such as let's say mf Hussain painting which is there it may have 10 copies or 100 copies and nft is created based on that underlying asset of a real uh, uh, artwork which is there then it could be asset back token which is there that could derive value but again the fundamental will be that it will derive value from the underlying asset not from the token itself so there are many people who have launched their own nfts if they catch eye based on their usages in a particular game format then they may be valuable but it is actually uh, it doesn't sink in well if you have to put your hardened money to buy something which is fictitious in nature uh, I mean, on Metaverse, people have been trading on, uh, 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 you know, a virtual Gucci bag, which even doesn't give you the utility value of the real Gucci bag, which is there, but they are being transacted for a uh, hundred of thousand dollars. So, uh, yes, this is an artificial world and may not survive. And therefore, uh, from a very technical perspective, where when we come from a finance background, I don't think so any of us would want to uh, uh, look at these class of assets from an investment perspective or any form of uh, 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 asset holding perspective in manner, unless the only idea to trade in this is uh, to take advantage of fluctuation or you know it's basically gambling uh, to put it in very crude format
So if anyone is interested in gambling, that can see. And actually, these NFTs are traded and have fluctuation of these nature only. If actually you look at some of the top trading NFTs, uh, which are listed, the fluctuation is see 100 uh, plus percentage in a day's time. Actually, uh, when some days back I was making a presentation on the similar topic or same topic, I had seen one of the NFTs which was actually uh, which had uh, increased uh, 10 lakh times uh, uh, within the 24 hour period. And then I don't know what's the current status of that. So that's what the fluctuating nature of these currencies are. Now, after understanding this entire framework, let us come to the the bread and butter part of it that is taxation aspects of these virtual digital assets since uh, these were being debated internationally recognized internationally a lot of people were uh, getting traction uh, uh, indian government also uh, you know thought that since people are transacting let us first recover the tax which is due on these uh, transactions which are being undertaken by resident indians from a regulatory standpoint of view government is still mulling uh, to see how uh, uh, basically this uh, regulation is to be created around uh, the digital currencies. There are another type of digital currencies which are being talked about from a government perspective, which are central government backed uh, digital currencies, which is equivalent of money. Basically, there will be instead of is issuing a physical currency, government would issue a, a tokenized currency, which will be in the digital form, but it will be backed by sovereign government. So therefore, the value of that centralized or uh, government money will be equivalent to INR. You can't expect a fluctuation in that, but it will provide ease of transacting from one person to another. And from government perspective, it will reduce cost of printing and maintaining or storing those assets in a particular form. What they may have to incur is only the infrastructure cost for issuing and transacting those uh, coins. Now, coming to income tax, Principally, a uh, new section 115 BBH has been introduced, which talks about taxation or, or tax on income of virtual digital asset. But uh, the way the provision is worded, uh, it says that where the total income of an SEC includes any income from a transfer of a virtual digital asset, then notwithstanding anything contained in any other provision of this act, income tax shall be payable at the rate of 30%. Now here, what is important is the, the wording of the provision it's not a non obstant provision which overrides the entire provisions of the act per se. What it overrides is only the uh, income tax uh, calculation part of it that it will be calculated at the rate of 30%. So rate is fixed, but other mechanisms are to be determined. And that's where I've highlighted three uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, words separately, total income transfer and virtual digital asset because these have specific meaning as far as income tax act is concerned. So principally, if you look at the provision, what it says is that where total income of an SSC and total income has been defined to mean an uh, 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 so income referred to in section five, which is computed in the manner which is laid down in the act itself. So if there is income which is computed in accordance with the provisions of income tax act that is under the each, any of the heads of income which is there and that income is in a form of a trans is arising from a transfer of a virtual digital asset. Now, for this purpose, transfer has been referred to what has been defined in section 247. And for people who may not have realized or who may not be practicing international taxation, transfer uh, the definition by virtue of a proviso was extended to a larger extent to include any kind of uh, transaction which results in uh, transfer or extinguishment of a right per se. But for the moment, I may not emphasize on that. But in layman terms, transfer is defined to mean sale, exchange, relinquishment of asset, extinguishment of asset as well. And therefore, transfer would mean that even if someone is gifting an asset or a virtual digital asset to someone, that would become taxable in the hands of transferer itself. However, the point is whether there is any consideration received or not, that we'll see whether gift would be taxable in the hands of transferer or not. But predominantly this, trans uh, this uh, provision would operate if there is a transfer of a virtual digital asset. Now, for this purpose, virtual digital asset has been very widely defined and under two, uh, section 247A of the Income Tax Act, which, would, which is defined to mean that any information, code or number or token, but not being an Indian currency or a foreign currency, which is generated through a cryptographic means, 
or otherwise. That means any information, code, number, or token generated through cryptographic means that was okay because that would have only covered the virtual asset situation or crypto uh, tokens which are used through the cryptographic means. But this word or otherwise has expanded the scope. That means any information code or number which is otherwise available in whatever uh, through whatever name it is called and it provides a digital representation of value which is exchanged with or without consideration with the promise or even representation of having inherent value or function as a store of value or a unit of account, including its use in a financial transaction or investment shall or which can be stored, transacted or transferred electronically, that would mean a virtual digital asset. That means anything which is digital in nature, be it uh, uh, in, by this manner, that is why there was a lot of UN cry on uh, uh, on the way uh, digital virtual digital asset is to be looked at principally the credit card uh, reward points or any kind of reward points which are credited would qualify for this uh, particular definition then any kind of uh, dematerialized share also would qualify as far as the vda definition is concerned unless specifically excluded which uh, we expect a clarification from central government because there is a, uh, a provision to have a notification from central government to exclude or include certain kinds of digital assets so there we may see that certain specific uh, very uh, straightforward exclusion which should be there should come in because otherwise they will contradict with the existing provision of capital asset which is defined already under the uh, income tax act and which represents a real asset but it is in the digitalized form uh, but it specifically includes virtual digital asset includes non-fungible tokens of any form or by any name whatever it is called by and it excludes specifically certain categories, which is basically subscription to your OTT platform or mobile applications, which are there that has been specifically excluded or clarified in that manner. But any kind of information code or number which is stored, which can give you a representation of value that is recognized or being considered as a virtual digital asset. Some of the important definitions, since there has been a mention of Indian currency and foreign currency in exclusion, one need to understand because reference has been given to the definition given to these terms under the uh, Foreign Exchange Management Act. So currency, uh, uh, because we have to understand whether Indian, what would fall under the category of Indian currency and foreign currency. Currency has been defined under 2H of FEMA to mean any kind of currency note, postal notes, or checks, drafts, and credit cards as well as may be notified by Reserve Bank of India. An Indian currency is something which is expressed on, drawn down in Indian rupee, but doesn't uh, uh, include one rupee note, which is specifically categorized under 28A of Reserve Bank of India Act 1934. Foreign currency means any currency other than Indian currency. Now here, the important factor which one need to notice, I had uh, highlighted stable coins of USDT and USDC, which is principally a link to US dollar, but they are still not foreign currency because they are not backed by foreign sovereign government. So one cannot uh, consider them as foreign currency and exclude from the class of virtual digital asset. They would still be recognized as a virtual digital asset. Now, from a uh, taxability point of view, different views may arise because as the provision says that any transfer of a virtual digital asset shall be taxed at 30%. Now, uh, it has not been uh, uh, clarified that under which head should it be. So one can also recognize virtual digital asset as a capital asset because it is one form of property. Though they have not included in a specific definition of property for the purposes of uh, uh, the definition of uh, capital asset, but principally for the purpose of 56 to 10, specifically the property has been defined to mean inclusive of virtual digital asset. That means if you recognize it as a property for one purpose, you have to recognize it as a property for other purpose also. From an indirect tax perspective, there is a different scenario or different perspective to it when it comes to uh, uh, intangible asset uh, recognition point of view. I will highlight that when we come to the indirect tax part of it. Uh, and see that why it is to be recognized as good for the purpose of GST Act or whether or not it should be recognized as a good or a service and what it should be classified as far as GST is concerned. From an income tax perspective, 
whether it is classified as less than 36 months or more than 36 months doesn't matter because the short term or long term rate is 30 percent there is nothing which is there and very importantly actually if you look at the provision of 115 bbh the subsection 2 very clearly states that notwithstanding anything contained in any other provision of this act no deduction in respect of any expenditure mind you any expenditure other than cost of acquisition of that asset or allowance or set off of any loss shall be allowed to the assessee under the provision of this act. That means no loss set off, no expenditure allowance will be there. Entire uh, value which is received in uh, by transfer of virtual digital asset is to be taxed at the flat rate of 30% on the gross value. Though there is some respite in the circular which has been uh, issued in form of 195 that we I, I will capture in subsequent slides. Secondly, what it also says is that there will be no set off of loss from transfer of any virtual digital asset which is computed as per subsection 1 shall be allowed against uh, uh, income computed under any other provision of this act. That means if transfer of virtual digital asset results into a loss, it's a sunk loss. There is no uh, benefit of that loss. If there is a gain, it is there and and this recalls me of a very slang concept which we used to follow at that time when we were students that you know we used to uh, tell each other that when a contribution was supposed to be made for a common uh, event or uh, for a, a common outing one used to say that ttmt or that means ttmm ttmm was uh, referred to in marathi as to the me maza means you will pay for yours i will pay for mine okay here the concept is that if you make income that is mine that means whatever is mine was always mine and whatever is yours is also mine that is the concept which government has as far as the approach is concerned while looking at virtual digital asset from a policy perspective the uh, the thought process which they have laid down is that principally uh, uh, these are not regulated ones and they want to discourage this. This is like, you know, since it is a speculation, uh, uh, a kind of asset today, they want to recover tax only on the gains and no losses could be recognized by the government of India. And since it's not been recognized principally, they are taking a view that no other benefit should be granted as far as uh, characterization is concerned. But the only advantage by classifying it as a uh, capital asset is concerned or the question which may arise is if one treats this uh, virtual digital asset as a capital asset since uh, subsection uh, 2 of 115 BBH permits you to take advantage of cost of acquisition whether uh, uh, if it is treated as cost of uh, uh, sorry if it is treated as capital asset whether for holding more than 36 months the uh, index cost of acquisition benefit can be taken by the uh, the person who's transferring the asset. So uh, if you actually look at the scheme of taxation of 100 and BB, 115 BBH, it gives you uh, a free way to use the provision or compute total income in the manner as it is laid down in the act. And therefore, one would also look at the scope of cost of acquisition, which is given under section 49. And from that perspective, uh, index cost of uh, acquisition should be available and that is what the only difference which this period of 36 months would make as far as calculation of uh, gain amount is concerned. Rate would remain same however the quantum may differ because of the uh, inflation factor which is there or the uh, index cost of acquisition point is concerned. Another point is whether uh, exemption under 54F or section 54, or, uh, I mean 54 is out of question because it's not house property, 54F could be availed of principally no, because uh, even if it is recognized uh, in the form of uh, uh, deduction or uh, uh, exemption, it will, it is specifically prohibited by subsection 2 and therefore there will be no relief which one can claim under section 54F for such uh, assets. Principally, if you treat it as business asset, there is no loss which can be offset in any ways. 30% so rate, flat rate will apply. It's only a classification difference. You treat it as IFOS, income from other sources, that is also fine and good. But 
there because there is a specific amendment which has been made under section 56 to 10 one has to be mindful of the fact that if a virtual digital asset has been received without any consideration it would get taxed in the hands of recipient even if the transfer is located outside of india therefore if someone is gifting you a virtual digital asset then that would be taxable at 30% rate as income from other sources and the market valuation is to be determined basis in that so uh some of the questions which may arise in uh, while classifying these is that how does one recognize because what is taxable is each class of ca uh, virtual digital asset that means each asset is to be uh, uh, calculated separately because what has been provided there is that loss from one asset is not offsetable against the other that means let's say if i have bought 10 units at one point in time of one virtual digital asset five unit at a different point in time and let's say when i am selling it i have sold two separately and three separately so in two though i would have put the transaction of five for selling but because of the open market mechanism it would have one would have got sold for loss and one would have got sold for profit what i may have to do is for two units which has resulted into loss that has to be ignored for the three units where there is a gain which is arrived that that needs to be uh, attacked so there is lot of exercise which one will have to do based on the transaction statement which is generated and if the exchange gives you a consolidated statement that this 15 has been sold for a weighted average cost of this then you are sorted because that is what the transaction data would reflect so that is what the difference is however if uh, uh, script wise or transaction wise details are available then one will have to do that exercise for each type of virtual digital asset separately and that will have to be there so i mean i would understand the difficulty for practitioners because it was uh, uh, already the pain which was created by cap, uh, the share uh, capital gain calculation which was to be reported script wise in, in the return of income if your client has traded in cryptocurrency then uh, mind you please ensure that you are charging uh, adequate amount of fees as professionals for doing this work when government is not giving it for charity Uh, certainly professionals cannot and that is why one need to be very much aware about clients who have uh, a psychology of uh, doing speculative transaction if they have entered into virtual digital asset transaction you had a good time with them or you can have a good time with them provided they are ready to pay you extra fee for the work which you are doing as far as other parts are concerned one other concern which remains is what exchange rate would one use if the uh, since these lot of these currencies are uh, virtual uh, digital assets are denominated in foreign exchange what would be the value one would adopt for the purpose of conversion in that sense if you actually look at the rule 115 it provides for the mechanism for trans, uh, for conversion of foreign exchange for the uh, different heads of income and principally that would be one which one have to uh, use another set of question which may arise in one's mind is that whether uh, the the cost which is incurred by a technocrat who is doing this as a profession mining of a crypto token by algorithmic uh, resolution of the questions which are put across on a open network that person is actually putting or doing this out of his uh, as part of his own profession or you know uh, resolving those queries which are put on the network and then getting rewarded in those tokens whether any cost which is incurred by deputing people or deploying people can that be claimed as a cost of acquisition principally it has been clarified that no expenditure will be allowed though logically uh, from a minor perspective that should have been allowed but government is clear that it's a policy decision and therefore uh, today the way it is worded no benefit of any revenue expenditure could be allowed uh, as far as that uh, expenditure incurred by the minor is concerned now uh, uh, in this regard there is a persuasive value from one of the clarification which was sought uh, when the debate was happening uh, in parliament though it was not that a huge amount of debate happened on this particular subject but a question which was laid down that whether infrastructure cost of mining uh, can be treated as cost of acquisition it was categorically answered in parliament by the finance minister that it it would not be treated as cost of acquisition this is only for the purpose of reference because when we come to income tax act unless there is a clarification issued in terms of the provisions of income tax act this may not have value per se one can still litigate and argue that from a professional perspective it's a, a business cost which is incurred and that should be considered as a cost of acquisition 
However, the way language is there today, no court will hold a view that it is an allowable deduction because it denies all kind of expenditure allowances or deduction. Another way to look at it, uh, look at that is that if in the normal uh, course of business or providing services as an engineer, if one is doing cryptographic uh, transactions as well or provide uh, enabling certain transaction and earning some coins and also doing other work, then one can continue to claim that expend as a business expenditure against the income which is otherwise earned by that person from the At provision to tax it, certainly we cannot miss the provision for uh, having a TDS on uh, such payments. And here it's very onerous responsibility which has been there. And now some of the questions which were raised, I, I will answer them. So whether uh, in case of a transfer of a crypto uh, asset on a crypto exchange, who will withhold the tax? From a user perspective, we have specific answers in the guidelines which have been provided under 194S, but principally the way provisions of 194S are worded, it casts an obligation on a person who's paying or who's responsible for paying to any person towards consideration of virtual digital asset to deduct tax at the rate of 1% uh, uh, of the consideration which is there. And in case if there is no PAN which is available, TDS will be uh, deducted at the rate of 20% directly. These TDS provisions are going to be effective from 1st of July 2022 and therefore they may be relevant. And there are certain standard exclusions which have been provided uh, in case of certain specified person which is basically individual and HUF whose total sales or gross receipts or turnover does not exceed 1 crore uh, in case of business or 50 lakh in case of profession. And in those cases, uh, the, uh, 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 the provisions of, uh, of uh, virtual digital asset related TDS may not apply if the total transaction value is less than 50,000 rupees. In all other cases where uh, uh, these provisions do not apply or you do not fall within the definition of specified person, that the transacting limit is only 10,000. That means any transaction more than 10,000 rupees, TDS obligation is there. The only respite which is given as far as the TDS provision is concerned is that there is no mandatory requirement to obtain TAN. So what is relevant now to look at it from a compliance perspective, and this is something which may have a lot of implication on uh, a regular practitioners that if someone is paying in any uh, to any person in real money for a transfer of virtual digital asset, or if someone is exchanging one virtual digital asset for the other, there will be obligation to deduct TDS. And that would be at the rate of 1%, which is uh, clarified. There's the mechanism to pay tax. And once uh, this provision of 194S is applicable, the provision of 203A, that is obtaining of TAN, and 206AB, that is in case where the return for last two years have not been filed to double the rate, that will not apply as far as provisions of 194S is concerned. As far as exclusion are concerned, I've already explained 50,000 rupees for people which are uh, considered as specified person where the audit may apply and in other cases 10,000 rupees which is there and it has also been clarified because there is a controversy that whether virtual digital asset can be classified as goods for the purpose of uh, uh, the normal uh, sale of goods act or in any manner because they can be considered as property based on the properties they may have. So if it is so, then we have another provision of 194O where the sale and purchase of goods, it, if it is considered as good, that may have. So it has been clarified that in case where 194O and 194S both become active, if TDS compliance is done under 194S, then 194O would not apply or 194S would be preferred over 194O as far as the transaction is concerned. Now, here again, a normal provision that any amount which is credited to a suspense account or by any name whatsoever, that also will be recognized as a transfer. The TDS is to be deducted on the date of credit or payment, whichever is earlier. Uh, so that is something which is to be recognized based on when the date of transfer has been triggered, if it is done through exchange. Normally, the way these transactions are happening today, they are being facilitated through exchanges where the uh, transactions are done in open market. 
however since these are a uh, direct wallet to wallet transaction one could also transact without an exchange and in that case obligation will be on a person who is transferring or who is paying in a consideration it would be very difficult to track down those transaction which are happening wallet to wallet where there is no banking channel involved and it would be very hard for one to obtain confirmation that whether a person has entered into such transaction or not and it may go unreported or untaxed in any way so that is one of the hurdle which is there in you know uh, uh, bringing this entire framework to taxation because if someone is holding a wallet internationally wallet doesn't require any uh, identity uh, uh, recognition it can only be through a gmail or a normal email account also one can uh, open a wallet on a particular uh, network or a particular blockchain and through that one can transact in that underlying unit so only if those Uh, entities are subject matter of automatic exchange of information or compliance on any of the international forums then information could travel to indian authorities but one has to be cautious of the fact that <clears throat> if people are using all these issuers are using proper banking channels for transaction they would be complying and they may be sharing information because they fall within the definition of financial institute from a fatca and uh common reporting standard perspective and therefore one need to be cautious while advising client that it may get uh, it may still remain unreported so in light of 194s6 which enable cbdt to issue certain guidelines for removing difficulties they have come out with certain clarifications two days back on 22nd of june uh, some of the questions which they have been put across that who is required to deduct tax in transfer of vds taking place through on or through an exchange so the point is that in a peer to peer transfer where exchange is not owning the asset that means virtual digital asset is not owned by exchange it is directly person to person transfer the person who is paying the consideration is responsible for uh, uh, deducting the tds and complying with the provisions of 194s however there may be situation where it has been done through exchange and there may be multiple parties who may be part of that exchange in that case what can happen so they have given two scenarios one in case where the transfer of virtual digital asset is taking place on or through an exchange and virtual digital asset being transferred is owned by the person other than the exchange that means still a scenario where person is owning it only the transaction is happening to the exchange mechanism what would happen principally what it provides is tds may be deducted by exchange provided there is a written agreement in place that exchange would complete that obligation and in such cases uh, if there is a broker of that exchange also is transacting then obligation may come either on the broker or exchange so one of them may uh, take that onus by entering into a written agreement and if one has completed that process or fulfilled that obligation then the obligation would not remain on the person who is making payment for that so that is what has been clarified so in that shell if virtual digital asset is not owned by exchange then the obligation is still on the person that is owner of virtual digital asset who is there however exchange may deduct tax on behalf of that person and fulfill that obligation what happens in case where transfer of virtual digital asset takes place through an exchange but virtual asset is owned by that exchange itself because in some cases exchanges are owning the crypto tokens they are just giving certain units to the account but it is not owned by those people it is just that fractional units are owned by some people in such case the buyer who is required to deduct tds that is the obligation so primarily the primary responsibility remains on the buyer however exchange may enter into a written agreement that all obligations relating to tds will be complied by the exchange and here the emphasis in these guidelines have been put on the written agreement that there has to be a written agreement so if exchange enters into a contract in such a manner that written uh, through written agreement the obligation has been put on the buyer then any person who is buying virtual digital asset even it, if it is through an exchange onus is on the buyer to comply with the tds provision and one would be considered as assessee in default if the provisions of 194s are not complied with therefore it is very essential 
for everyone to look at the underlying contractual arrangement or the framework which an exchange has adopted before one advises a client with respect to the compliance on transfer of virtual digital asset. Again, there is a separate statement which is required to be filed in 26 QF, which is there or 26 Q in certain normal cases, there is a, a specific provision which is being made for uh, providing details of the transfers which have been made. But here again, the emphasis which has been done in these guidelines is that uh, the primary owners remains on the person who's transferring it, that is the transferor. Now here, another important aspect to be noted is the way 194S6 is worded, it says that CBDT or the government may have power to issue guidelines. So these are not circular, which are in only binding on department. Though they have been issued in the form of circular, these are termed as guidelines and enabling provisions say that these would be binding on the assessee also. Therefore, these circulars which are issued under 194S or similarly under 194R are in the form of guidelines for removal of doubt. And therefore, these are binding on the assessee also. One cannot challenge their validity as to applicability on only on department. Now, for the purpose of these guidelines, first time they have defined the term exchange also, which says that any person that operates an application or a platform for transferring of virtual digital asset, which matches, buys and sell and executes same on application would be regarded as an exchange. So here, even if, because this is an unregulated space, any person who creates a mobile application and enables transaction in virtual digital asset would be recognized as an exchange or a platform and these provisions would apply to that person. Broker means a person who operates that application for transferring a virtual digital asset and holds an account with the uh, exchange for execution of such trade would be recognized. It's a normal brokerage mechanism which exists for share transfer or securities transactions as well. Another question is that if question number with respect uh, one was with respect to transfer where consideration is in cash, that is what we looked at, who would have the obligation? What happens in case if there is an exchange of virtual digital asset, that means it's in kind. So who will have that obligation? Because there are two people who are having transfers and both shall have that obligation. So it has been clarified that in such case where there is an exchange of one virtual digital asset, that is, for example, a digital asset A with digital asset B, and if they one is exchanging uh, A for B, then both are transferring it and both are recognized as buyers. So both will have to discharge their obligation of respective TDS of 1% on the consideration value based on the valuation mechanism, which is prescribed and show that the proof of tax that payment has been made, a proof of tax has been there and only then it should be exchanged. That is what the provision says. Now, what happens, there may be issues when exchange is in between while these transactions are happening. So there, the mechanism is that if there is a written agreement and exchange undertakes this obligation, then it will be the responsibility of the crypto uh, transacting exchange to pay that tax on behalf of both the legs of the transaction. Now, another layer of complication will get added because both the cryptocurrencies are virtual digital asset itself. That means exchange may have to deduct that virtual digital asset itself and then convert it into some other uh, currency for converting in, into INR. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so for that purpose, what has been clarified that, you know, in case where exchange picks up an option that it will comply with 194S provision, then first it need to deduct uh, that particular portion or percentage of amount in uh, uh, same virtual currency and then convert it into cash and pay to the government before that transaction takes place. So for example, currency A with currency B, it will deduct 1% from currency A and 1% from currency B, then convert that into INR and pay the tax. Another way it is given that in case if exchange is deducting that in the same currency, then first it needs to convert that kind into primary virtual digital asset. So they have again come with the concept of primary virtual digital asset and secondary virtual digital asset. Primary, they have classified as Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT and USDC. These are the four examples which have been given. That means as per the guidelines, only four bit, uh, cryptocurrencies are considered as primary, all other are secondary. So if transaction is in the primary currency, then there is no problem. It will be immediately converted to INR and tax will have to be paid. 
if it is in some other virtual digital asset then it will first have to be converted from that to either of these four uh, primary virtual digital asset and then the tax needs to be paid now it has also been clarified since one virtual digital asset will get converted to another virtual digital asset there will be an implication of transfer because there will be a transfer of that particular virtual digital asset to another form that would not be regarded as transfer for this purpose from an exchange perspective it will become difficult to transact uh, all transactions uh, one by one so they have given a leeway that anything which any kind of tds which has been deducted throughout the day and that period is also defined that 12 am to 2359 hours that entire amount needs to be collated and that amount of virtual digital asset need to be converted in inr immediately at 12 am itself to algorithmic manner and entire trail of this transaction is to be maintained by the exchange so there is lot of onus which has been put on exchanges so if you are an advisor to any of the exchange there will be lot of compliance which one will have to look at and government has put all this onus on the exchanges to maintain the transaction trail and provide this in the form of tds record another question which has been clarified is whether provisions of 194 uh, q uh, would be applicable they said without getting into the controversy if they said that 194 q will be required if 194 s is complied with there would be no uh, impact on that question 4 is a slight relief if there is any uh, gst which is applicable on this virtual digital asset or any cost of rendering this service of brokerage is deducted then whether uh, gross amount is to be considered for tds or net here they have said that net consideration that is after reducing the cost of transaction in virtual digital asset or gst will have to be considered so what happens when the payment is made by payment gateway will there be a dual obligation on payment gateway in the buyer as well principally they have clarified that payment gateway is only a mechanism for making payment and therefore all this obligation would only remain on the buyer that is the person who's transacting principally here uh, another question was that there is a threshold amount which is prescribed which is for the financial year and provisions are getting affected from 1st july so what they have said is though obligation to deduct tds triggers from 1st july but for monetary threshold transactions prior to 1st july that is between 1st of april to 30th june should also be considered while applying the threshold limit as far as calculation is concerned so if someone has transacted more than 50000 worth of inr uh, uh, worth of virtual digital asset then tds provisions would still apply from first transaction itself you need not wait for 50000 worth of transaction or 10000 worth of transaction as the case may be applicable so this is in nutshell domestic perspective international if a person non resident is transacting in a indian virtual digital asset would it be become taxable under section 9 uh, because it says deemed to accrue or arise in india uh, since in case of virtual digital asset the situs is very difficult to identify at this stage it may not be relevant but we have a provisions of significant economic presence where if a, a non resident entity is marketing in india has a user base in india certainly business connection would be established and it would be deemed to accrue or arise in india and therefore one has, has to be careful uh, while dealing with non residents who are marketing in india these virtual digital assets through digital means the significant economic presence is one of the major impact to that similarly equalization levy may also come into picture if there is a marketing or it through an uh, uh, e-commerce platform if someone is uh, supplying this but for that one will have to first conclude whether it is a supply of service or goods and for that purpose we will go to the uh, uh, characterization of this particular virtual digital asset in uh, under the gst principally for anything which is to be recognized as good under the gst it should be anything which is movable property other than money and securities uh, but includes actionable claims as goods on the point is this is a actionable claim because one uh, uh, has a right to receive a consideration in respect of a virtual token though there is no uh, underlying uh, validation that which jurisdiction will prevail over it but yes one can say that yes there is some amount of right which is there while the owner is owner holds that currency though it is not backed by any particular authority however 
at the same time one may also see that it, uh, exclusion mechanism if we see it is certainly not a security very technically if you look at the definition of security which is given under uh, uh, the securities contract regulation act there a derivative which gives a right in a security is also covered so if a virtual digital asset gives a right in a underlying asset it could be recognized as derivative for gst purposes but i would see that it would only be resolved at supreme court level one uh, once the provisions of uh, vda are challenged for gst purposes as to what it would be classified but principally a lot of senior counsels have uh, uh, given a view that it could uh, fall under the category of goods because in in the category of intangible asset uh, earlier in uh, in a case of tata consultancy services versus the state of andhra pradesh supreme court had held that uh, 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 goods can be tangible and both intangible in the test to determine whether a property is goods is whether the concerned item is capable of being abstraction consumption use and whether it can be transmitted transferred delivered stored and possessed now actually we look at these principles uh, virtual digital asset will fulfill all these conditions and therefore one may recognize them to be an intangible property in that sense uh, and therefore indirectly could be recognized as good but i am not a gst expert so i i would not want to give a conclusive remark on this and it's very a raw space right now to form a opinion per se but on a safer side yes gst authorities when they want to tax everything and with the negative definition of supply i believe it would uh, be brought under taxation as far as gst is concerned and therefore that 18% may be a implication now uh, uh, the question from a gst perspective is that if the transactions are being take, undertaken through exchanges exchanges would be classified as intermediary so whether reverse charge mechanism will apply and therefore one will have to deduct uh, or uh, uh, you know uh, put a gst uh, uh, obligation on the exchanges or it would still remain on the person who are transacting and what if if the person who's transacting is not otherwise registered for the purpose of gst and is transacting in uh, transacting in crypto will the registration obligation trigger in if uh, the threshold limit of 20 lakhs or 40 lakhs as the case may be uh, gets triggered uh, certainly 40 lakhs may come into picture because it will be regarded as uh, goods uh, if it is regarded as good for that matter and how would one recognize this transaction and who will bear the gst obligation i think these are open questions i also do not have specific answers to them but one will have to evaluate that and i believe many of our friends uh, uh, may be specializing in gst and may look at these aspects when it comes to virtual digital assets now as far as citus is concerned again uh, what would be the place of supply i believe it will all depend uh, where that uh, uh, exchange would give you the account holding or that accounts uh, citation is concerned i remember that from a stamp duty perspective there are decisions to say that uh, in case of shares wherever the shares register is maintained that is the place where uh, one is considered to have the citus of those securities well for crypto it is very difficult because one will have lot of challenges to identify the specific location servers may be somewhere else it may be only be reflected in certain accounts so it will be very difficult for one to identify that but as far as department is concerned for them if they have to tax it it has to be in india and therefore one may face challenges in terms of gst classification with uh, this only last few remarks as far as foreign exchange management act is concerned since it's not been included in the definition of securities foreign securities or uh, currency in that sense today as the way foreign exchange management act is worded any transaction in foreign currency with respect to crypto asset according to uh, a principle is not permitted under fema however many people have been transacting it using the lrs route and we will have to see how rbi takes that view tomorrow or whether they will be asked to do compounding at a later stage with this thank you uh, for your patient listening and i hand over the proceeding back to the organizers thanks a lot siddharth basically the thing is you already have covered all the questions which i had in my mind or rather i received on my postal window to be asked 
and th those are already being very well covered and answered by you in your q and a slides so uh, still the forum is open if, if if at all anybody has any further queries apart from the deliberation that siddharth has just now given to us members anyone okay because i personally had the question like uh, in case of gifting of the uh, vda how it will be valued at the time of transfer for the gifted vda but then that has also been covered by you and regarding the interchangeability at the time of set off and carry forward so that has been covered and then the gst thing was on my mind but thanks thanks a lot for the detailed deliberation from your end and the uh, self explanatory ptt that you had apart from the easy to understand and easy to imagine and visualize uh, explanation that you had for the slides that you were presenting during the session thanks a lot for uh, accepting our invitation and for being the wonderful faculty on such a difficult topic to comprehend thanks a lot siddharth see you soon and i really thank all our uh, members who joined us for this topic hoping to see you again have a wonderful time thank you good night thank you